everybody. This is Donna Foster with the Patient Safety Movement Foundation. Good morning. This is Rich Carmona. Good morning, Dr. Carmona. How are you? I'm so glad that you were able to join us. I am. I've got about 15 minutes, so I stepped out of another meeting. I'm at a board meeting in Las Vegas, so they're already in stack, so I'm just going to step out for 15 minutes. I hope that will help at least. Yes, that would be great. All right. Well, we'll go ahead and get started then, and we're going to get you to, to jump in in just a moment, okay? Okay. Yes, you bet. Thank you. Okay, great. All right. Well, good morning, everybody. We're going to go ahead and get started because we have a lot of uh, a lot of information to share today, and I want to make sure that we get have some time for a question and answer at the end. Uh, my name is Donna Prosser, and I am the Chief Clinical Officer here at the Patient Safety Movement Foundation. We have three members of our board joining us this morning, uh, Steve Barker, Robin Betts, and Mike Durkin, and then also Dr. Rich Carmona. So thank you so much for being able to, to join us today. Uh, Dr. Carmona, you want to tell us a little bit about your background? Um, well, I'm a distinguished professor at the University of Arizona, where Steve Barker also on the faculty, and I have other appointments at other universities. but. Uh, my background's primarily been as a test, mostly a first responder all my life, as a paramedic or a registered nurse, physician assistant, and uh, also uh, in the military for a number of years, and culminating in being Surgeon General of the United States. My training is in general vascular surgery with subspecialty in trauma, burns, and critical care, and I ran emergency medical systems and trauma systems for uh, a good part of my career. Wow, that's great. Well, thank you so much for being able to join us today. What a great, great surprise for us. Uh, Dr. Barker. Steve? Are you, are you there, Steve? Okay, how about Robin? Robin, can you uh, introduce yourself? Oh, I think we might have some folks muted. Hold on one second while we try to troubleshoot this. Steve, you're unmuted. If you would tell us a little bit about your background. Okay. Robin, you're unmuted. Let me try this. Mike? Oh, there you are, Robin. Hi, Hi Donna. Can you, this is Robin, yes. can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so I'm Robin Betts. I'm the Vice President of Quality, Clinical Effectiveness and Regulatory Services for um, Kaiser Permanente here in Northern California. Um, we cover um, and, and ensure 4.4 uh, million members here in Northern California and have 21 hospitals. I have infection prevention as part of my oversight portfolio. I am also an adjunct professor at a university and teach uh, uh, in the Master's in Healthcare Administration um, in another state So, and, and on the board of the Patient Safety Movement Foundation. So thank you. I'm really happy to be here. Thank you, Robin. All right. Mike, did I hear you on the line? Hi. Yep. Uh, hi, Donna. Thank you very much for asking. Uh, can you hear me? We sure can. You can. Great. Thank you. So, um, well, uh, thank you for asking me to join this, uh, join the webinar. Um, for those who don't know me, uh, my name is Mike Durkin. I'm currently a professor at Imperial College London, uh, working to support uh, the Patient Safety Translational Research Center. Um, and uh, my previous role was as the National Director for Patient Safety for the NHS uh, in England. Uh, and I'm currently now uh, working also with WHO uh, in supporting the development of a global patient safety collaborative. Uh, and as Donna has said, I, I sit on the board of the Patient Safety Movement Foundation as well. Thank you. Look, very much looking forward to this this session. Great. Thank you, Mike. And Steve, are you are you on the line? I'm here. Can you hear me? Great. I sure can. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'm Steve Barker. Uh, as you heard, I'm a friend of Rich Carmona. I'm an anesthesiologist professor and chair emeritus at the University of Arizona. I am also the chief science officer for Massimo Corporation. Excellent, great. All right, well then let's go ahead and get started. I know that everybody is anxious to, 
learn a little bit more about what's happening right now with the coronavirus. And as everybody knows, this is a, a new outbreak, what we call a novel outbreak. This is a new coronavirus that has been identified as SARS-CoV-2. And that is the, the name of the virus that causes the disease that is known as COVID-19. You can see on the screen here, this is a screenshot from the Johns Hopkins website. This is updated on a regular basis. I pulled this offline at 6.23 a.m. Uh, Pacific Standard Time. So that was just about an hour and a half ago. Um, and and uh, we are gonna share the link to this if you are interested in, in seeing uh, the updates of confirmed cases. As you can see, there are several hotspots around the world. Uh, we, <clears throat> in, when we talk about outbreaks, you know, we think in terms of epidemics versus pandemics. An epidemic is when there's an outbreak in a certain particular location, and a pandemic is when it has spread across the globe. Not at pandemic levels yet, but we anticipate that it will be. Um, and then we're going to talk a little bit about the background, but since Dr. Hermione was able to join us this morning, um, and I know you don't have a whole lot of time uh, with us this morning, Dr. Carmona, would you tell us a little bit about the history of how we've dealt with outbreaks in the past? Yes, I'd be happy to. Thanks very much. And to my colleagues on the line, uh, my apologies for having to run. I'm at another board meeting right now where we're discussing the same thing, but in Las Vegas. So uh, thanks for the opportunity to uh, comment on this. Um, this uh, issue of dealing with cor uh, coronavirus comes under the umbrella of what we call emerging infections globally. And for those that are interested who are not in the first responder area, you can go to dhs.gov or hhs.gov and look at the National Response Framework, which outlines the national plan for surge capacity and relationship building, a whole host of issues that are necessary to deal with any emerging infection, not just coronavirus, but also any and all man-made or naturally occurring disasters that the, the United States may face, like earthquakes, tsunamis, uh, active shooters, everything falls under that umbrella. And the reason is, is that we term this all hazards because any and all hazards have the same first responders, the same EMS infrastructure, the same hospitals, the same trauma centers, and so on. And so for those of us who work in this field, it's just another threat that falls under that umbrella that utilizes the same uh, infrastructure and expertise of all of the people that we have. Uh, the concept that's important to understand is surge capacity, and that is when something bad happens and often will overwhelm a, a local community, that we have uh, a mutual understanding and mutual agreements with other communities and we surge. That means we start to combine assets. And at some cases, like in Katrina, it becomes a national emergency and we have every and all assets responding. And in this case, each community has to be prepared for this emerging infection. Where we are today, as was already pointed out, you know, we're approaching pandemic. You can argue if we're there already with all the countries that are involved. But the most important thing here is that I would say social distancing at this point. And that doesn't mean to shut down operations or anything. It really just means to be uh, smart in how we interact with others, try and stay away from big groups, things like that, because each and every one of us could be a vector. So the idea is to cut down on the amount of vectors and transmissions. The risk really is to the very senior persons who have debilitating diseases. If you have cancer, if you have uh, lots of chronic diseases, if you're immunocompromised or at the other end of the spectrum, infants who don't have a completely uh, uh, functioning, if you will, immuno immunologic system with, you know, with a newborn. But for most of us, um, this will be a bad cold, but yet it can still be uh, debilitating and uh, it will take uh, you know, a week or two for you to recover. But the, the importance about social distancing is we don't wanna continue to perpetuate this most of my colleagues at CDC, who I've talked to often on daily calls, think, hoping that this is going to burn out, much like the common flu does, that it peaks in the winter, and then going towards spring and summer, it just burns out. We can assist it in accelerating and burning out if we practice good hand washing, social distancing, uh, and all of the usual public health things that we talk about in something like this. So I'll stop with that and happy to answer any questions uh, if there's something germane to me. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. If anybody has a question um, for Dr. Carmona, then, um, then uh, write in your chat 
in the chat box what the question is because uh, we're going to have to let him go in just a second here. Yeah, there's a lot of information again to our colleagues around around the world. I know I was just uh, on the phone with some NHS folks in uh, the uh, National Health System in um, uh, in, in Britain. Um, you know, we're all looking at this the same way, especially in developed nations. Big challenge with underdeveloped countries who are struggling that don't have the infrastructure. But I would encourage all of our colleagues to follow cdc.gov, which will give you the daily updates through the CDC eyes. NIH.gov is helpful. Tony Fauci's up there, probably the premier virologist in the world who's not only looking at this uh, through the lens of uh, how we stop it, but also a vaccine. And uh, then, of course, the WHO, which is tracking global uh, implications for this. Excellent. Thank you. We do have one question for you, uh, Rich. Is, yes. uh, what defines a large group? Well, it's, you know, that is, uh, I say, in the eyes of the beholder. If you're in a, in other words, if, if you're in New York City and you find five people that have this, it's a relatively small group, what we call a cluster, and then you want to know immediately what, how they're related, where did they come from, because it helps to uh, be able to predict what the extension is. Let's say you're in small town America where you have a population of a couple of hundred and you have five or ten people in that community coming up. That's a, that's a different problem because of the cluster as it relates to the total population. So these are relative terms that are used, sometimes can be confusing, but I think the most important thing epidemiologically, we're looking where these clusters pop up of any given group of patients. And then it's important that our, in the federal level, our epidemiologic intelligence service will then start tracking and find out where you were, who you spoke to, where did you travel to, somebody in your family just came from another country. And that starts to build a picture of how this is spreading, which is very helpful to our epidemiologists to translate into common language to help people understand how to stop the spread of, of this problem. That's great. Thank you so much. Well, I know that you have to have to jump off the phone. I know we only had you until 8.15. We do have a, a couple of other questions, but I believe we're going to be able okay. to answer those questions as we move through okay. the rest of the presentation. So All right. thank, well, you thank, so you, thank you so much, for so joining much. us. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye Okay. Now. Okay. Bye-bye. Okay, so let's move on and talk a little bit about the background. As I said, we're, we're seeing some questions coming in, and I think we're going to be able to answer a lot of those as we move through the presentation. If not, there's time at the end for a question and answer session. Um, Steve, do you want to tell us a little bit about the background of what's been happening with the coronavirus and how we got where we are? Sure. I hope you can hear me fine. This is a, a new strain of coronavirus that started in Wuhan, China in late December. Coronavirus itself is, has been around as, as long as we know. It's responsible for the common cold. Uh, previous serious out, outbreaks include something called MERS, Mi Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, which was transmitted apparently by camels. And of course, SARS, the Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, which had a fairly high mortality. The last outbreak of SARS was in 2003. Uh, both of those diseases involve animal transmission, which is a common characteristic. By the way, the name coronavirus comes, corona means crown. The cells actually have spicules sticking out that makes it look somewhat like the prominences on a crown. Um, again, comparing the COVID-19, which is today's uh, strain, with SARS, SARS had a much higher mortality but COVID-19 appears to be more contagious, and the transmission is extremely rapid, and it's become, you saw on that map from the John Hopkins uh, website, how fast it's spreading. I don't know why, frankly, they're not calling it a pandemic, because it is in every continent of the world, except perhaps Antarctica. Um, there is no human immunity. As I said, the mortality, uh, uh, and Donna said also, the mortality is relatively low, but there's over 3,000 deaths now. And uh, th this is being updated almost by the minute. I strongly recommend that Johns Hopkins website that uh, she showed the map. That's updated at least every hour. Uh, World Health Organization has implemented an incident management system and you can check their website frequently for um, everything we know and are, have learned about it. 
uh, cases have spread, as, as I said, and as the map shows, around the world. Not mentioned on the slide is that the number two country in deaths now is Italy already, and that's a very rapid spread they've had there. Um, furthermore, it, although the, the, you know the theory is that it starts with animals, and and uh, that's one possibility of how it initially got started in Wuhan. But the other thing to keep in mind is that there is a large uh, active virology laboratory that happens to be in Wuhan. Uh, but anyway, now we, are, we have what's called community-acquired illness, which means person-to-person -person transmission, uh, documented not just several, but many countries, including the U.S. now. There has been uh, documented cases of human transmission, and you'll hear more about that as we go along. Again, the, the WHO World Health Organization website has a detailed history of that. Follow that, and and also the uh, the map page on Johns Hopkins I find to be excellent and is kept up to date. Uh, we're going to talk a little about what works and what doesn't work from previous outbreaks, but remember these are to some degree extrapolations. Uh, COVID-19 is new; it's got new properties, new characteristics, and we're still learning about it. So uh, I'll stop there with the background and pass it back to Donna. Great, great, excellent. And we've got several questions coming in asking for links and such. This PowerPoint presentation is going to be shared with everybody that is on the line. And you'll see that we have several links embedded in here, including the, um, the, the link for the Johns Hopkins uh, site. This is a detailed history uh, that is on the, the um, World Health Organization website. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Um, and so when you get this presentation, you'll be able to access all of these links that we're, we're talking about. Okay, well, let's move on to talk a little bit about the, vir the virology of uh, coronavirus. Robin, you want to talk about this? Yeah, I'd love to. So then I've seen some questions coming up, so this might uh, help with some of those prior questions. But so uh, I'll just kind of run through these different topics that kind of address uh, many of the areas of, of, of the broader category of virology, but the incubation period, now this is the, the period of time that elapses between an initial exposure to a virus or other infectious organism and then when the symptoms first appear. So it's estimated to be two to 14 days. So you could have been exposed but not get sick for 14 days. Um, and then, you know, you have to ask the question, well, how do you get it? And um, this little image here of this, this individual coughing is really demonstrates the difference between airborne and, and droplets. So airborne spread uh, happens when germs float through the air after a person talks, coughs, or, or sneezes, and, and germs may land in the eyes and the mouth and the nose of another person. And they're very lightweight uh, germs, and so they kind of hang out in the air, and you don't really need direct contact with an infected person uh, to actually get sick. So some common airborne diseases include chickenpox, um, really hard to contain in a family. Uh, measles is probably the most um, contagious um, airborne uh, virus that, uh, that people get exposed to, and those would be demonstrated by the little gray dots. Now, coronavirus is a droplet. Uh, it's heavier, so droplet spread happens when germs traveling inside droplets uh, that are coughed or sneezed from a sick person, um, they enter the eyes, the nose, or the mouth of another person. The droplets travel short distance because they drop. They're heavier, as indicated by the red, um, the red circles in this picture. They generally drop less than three feet from one person to another. So a person might also get infected by touching a surface or objects that have germs on them, so, um, and then touch your mouth and nose. So droplets can spread, they say, uh, anywhere from three to six feet within a person coughing. Reports out of China indicate that most infections have occurred in close contacts with family, colleagues, or um, healthcare workers with it that have been in contact with a contagious individual. Um, asymptomatic individuals, so those people who don't um, have any symptoms, 
have been documented to transmit the virus. So even though they don't appear sick and, and didn't feel sick themselves, they were still able to transmit the, the virus. And some evidence of spread has really occurred through contact with surfaces contaminated with droplets, but this um, doesn't uh, appear to be the primary mode of spread. I wanna talk a little bit about transmiss, uh, transmissibility. So it's estimated to be somewhere between two to four, depending on the scientific paper. Now there's like this R factor, and I'm not gonna talk about this, but what it, what it means is that um, one infected person will on average spread the virus to two to four individuals. So based on um, scientific analysis, COVID-19 is more transmissible than um, stand, the standard influenza and potentially similar to SARS. So, and, and uh, Dr. Barker just mentioned SARS, uh, which was kind of our last big, one of the last big outbreaks that we've had in this country. And then um, I wanna talk a little bit about the severity. How sick do people get? Um, and really 80% of individuals with documented COVID disease, so those are the ones that actually got tested, were asymptomatic or had very mild illnesses. So really um, just had those uh, light cold sy symptoms. Um, different, you know, there's different reports about mortality and it's estimated to be around two to 3%. However, we really don't know um, the denominator, which would significantly lower this number because most people who are asymptomatic never go to the doctor and have not been tested. So we really don't know how many people have had it um, and, and we probably will never know. Um, but it is um, very, uh, I think it was, uh, uh, Dr. Carmona mentioned it's really the, the elderly and frail. We've had one death and um, it was a very elderly, um, frail individual. Um, and and, and, and I, when I say one death, I mean one death in my organization. Um, so uh, the convalescent period, uh, this is the period in which an individual is clinically recovered and no longer capable of transmitting the virus. And um, that's determined to be about 15 to 30 days after the onset of the infection. Um, so we're still learning about the virus. These are kind of broad ranges, but um, like we said, we're still learning about this emerging, um, this emerging a germ in our world. So um, that's kind of, I, I think I can turn it back over to you, Donna. Okay, excellent. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. All right, well, currently where we're at right now is, as we mentioned before, there is global spread. We, we, we do anticipate a pandemic classification shortly. Um, you know, as Robin said, it is a roughly 2 or 3% mortality rate, um, and, um, but about 16% of those infected are going to get seriously ill. And so that means that hospitals really need to start uh, preparing for their capacity surge, and Robin's going to talk a little bit about that in a moment. Of course, this has caused significant anxiety and concern across the globe. Um, and one of the things that we hope to be able to reinforce today is that, um, you know, we, there is no need to panic at this point because most people are not going to get seriously ill from this. Um, and so um, we're going to talk a little bit later about the things that people can do to keep themselves safe and their loved ones safe and, um, and hopefully to bring some um, to, to, to mitigate some of that anxiety. At the present, there is no vaccine. Um, so, so in terms of treatment, we're just following standard flu symptom management. Uh, Tamiflu, uh, the, the medication that we use for influenza, won't work for this particular virus because it's specific to the influenza virus. But there are some other antivirals out there that are being tried. We don't have any, um, any definitive information on that yet, but we're working on it. And testing kits are slowly becoming more available. Everybody's probably heard on the news that there were, there were some, um, some difficulties getting testing kits out, but that's, that's starting to, um, to abate now. So the more the testing kits become available, the more we'll be able to know. I'm still responds. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. If, uh, if somebody is- We went through that already. Somebody <laughs> she, please she hasn't read through that, that's obviously. If, if, you're, yeah. um, um, if you're on the WebEx, yeah, if we have to reschedule, 
I, I haven't read my email, so I think what I propose is having no? someone pull care to see how yeah. up to date right. they are. Hold on, guys. We're, we're going to try to keep call them on and see what, where the last percent. place they were at. Um, if they're on LCR. Give us a moment. I apologize. I had a time to try to get records. That would be helpful right, as well. Hello? Yeah. If you can hear me and you can, thank you so much. Excellent. Okay. All right, so as I mentioned, um, the testing kits are slowly becoming more available, and so that is going to help us to identify who is infected and who is not. Um, and the, and, and as, as Robin mentioned, the more that we are able to test and find out how many people are infected with the virus, the more we're going to be able to determine exactly what that mortality rate is. And hopefully that will, that will be lower once we identify how many people have the virus and just don't have any symptoms. In the meantime, um, our, communities, our communities are responding with containment strategies that they have been, as you guys have probably heard, uh, several events are being canceled as we have had to cancel our summit here. So have many other conferences across the world been canceled. Uh, there's a lot of um, uh, schools and workplaces that are trying to determine how they're going to, uh, to mitigate this. Um, and, and, you know, as I said, we, we start with containment. But we really, as you can see on the map on this page, we're kind of past the point of containment right now. Um, the virus is out, and so now we need to move into a mitigation strategy. And Robin's going to talk a little bit about that moving forward. The Johns Hopkins map that we talked about on the first slide is linked right here. And as I mentioned, we'll send you this PowerPoint presentation, and you'll be able to access all of these links. All right, Robin, you want to talk a little bit about the recommendation? Yes, I can do that. Thank you. So here are some just general recommendations for the public. So keep in mind it is still cold and flu season and um, you really use the same precautions for COVID-19 that you would use to avoid catching a cold or flu. So I won't read them all. However, good hygiene is hand hygiene is really critical. Keep your hands away from your face. Um, avoid crowds and keep your distance from those who are sick. Um, stay home if you're sick and prevent to prevent spreading um, contagions yourself and then disinfect high um, touch surfaces at home. Um, so we just kind of laid these out for you knowing this can come out. They, these are kind of general um, uh, practice standards to avoid um, virus spread, viral spread. And uh, you can use these to share on your websites. Um, I know many of the people that are part of the Patient Safety Movement Foundation have um, venues in which they can share information. In fact, the next slide, if you want to go to that, we have some links to um, some helpful videos around hand hygiene. Um, and, oh, oh, I guess the... Uh, I apologize, sure. Robin. I think it's the this one, yeah. That one there? Yeah, thank you. That's okay. Yeah. Um, so we provided these links to some of the public education videos that promote hand hygiene and you can share them with your community or um, add links to your web pages, share them at staff meetings. It just as much as we can get uh, the general population um, cooperating and understanding what they need to do, as well as um, mitigating fear. And I think, Donna, you brought up a really good point about, um, you know, uh, there's a lot of sensationalism around this. So there's a lot of um, constant media, and so it kind of raises the the fear in general society. Um, any pandemic kind of has this curve where, you know, you kind of, it's a steep bell curve where uh, you get this exposure and then pretty soon, like a flu season, it kind of dies off and we have general exposure and, and coronavirus will remain in our communities over time, but we'll have built up immunity. And so we won't see um, the, the, the spike but also preceding that curve is often a societal fear curve or panic curve. And we really need to do all that we can uh, to prevent the anxiety of those that we work with, that those that we associate with and, and help them understand that they can control um, their exposure and their potential risk. So I'll um, Great. turn it yeah. back to you. Thank you. Great, thank you. And, um, and Mike, do you want to talk a little bit about this great little video clip that you that you shared with us? Yeah, thank thank you, Donna, and, and thank you, Robin, for such a, a clear exposition there of what we need to do. Some of the 
the key elements, as as uh, Rick Kawana said, was was actually this this behavior um, modification that we we need to we need to carry through with, and this is a societal issue as well as a personal one. Um, so, as alongside social distancing, uh, which he talked about, it's it's absolutely vital that we do recognize the importance of hand washing uh, and also then uh, particularly touching our nose, our mouth, uh, our face, where most of our own droplets um, uh, will will be resident. Um, and, and so it's very difficult to do that. I just want to share with you a, uh, a video that was posted, um, which was, uh, it'll be interesting to see what you, what you think of it, but it, it sends a couple of messages out for me. Uh, thanks, Donna. Okay, great. Okay, great. Today, start working. Uh -oh. Apologize. So, for those of you who are, who are looking but can't can't hear anything, we'll run it a couple of times. But effectively, these are colleagues um, who are uh, talking about coronavirus uh, and giving an update on the current situation uh, uh, in in their area. Uh, and this lady has been very good in really giving good advice to to the public. Um, but then, as you can see, just as she talks about the importance of hand washing and of keeping your fingers and hands away from your nose, your mouth and your face, she she automatically uh, uh, links uh, licks her, her tongue to uh, move the paper forward uh, from her crib sheet. Um, so. Uh, in some situations, this may be seen as quite funny. Uh, in others, it may be seen as quite sad. And we, we don't actually know whether she did it on purpose. Uh, but the key element, I think, is to demonstrate how difficult it is for us to go through not only five minutes uh, of, of not touching our hands or our face, but going through uh, 24 hours, 36 hours, uh, as long periods as possible. The other key issue, I think, is to remember that that after we touch our face, that's when we should be washing our hands, um, uh, and also before food and after food, and also uh, incredibly important uh, when we're in public spaces uh, and using um, uh, 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 any sort of uh, of area that we, we we're trying to protect ourselves and protect uh, our fellow populations. I think that's all I wanted to say on that Excellent. one. Uh, sorry. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Mike. That's a really great point. You know, it is it is human nature for us to touch our faces, and um, and as as Robin mentioned, these these links are here in this presentation that you'll receive uh, to uh, if if people need some instruction on how to wash their hands. A lot of folks don't wash their hands long enough, so these links will um, will help to to show people exactly how they need to do this. All right, Robin, you want to talk a little bit about how healthcare facilities need to prepare for this. Yes, I can do that. And I, I just want to start, you know, we've, we've been using two terms, containment and mitigation, and uh, both of those have different approaches to how we have to manage um, uh, the population as they come in and out of our system. When, when in, in containment mode, the strategies are really designed to halt the spread of an infection. So ultimately, the goal is to isolate individuals with the infection as well as those potentially exposed to the infection and the goal with the goal of preventing spread to the general population. So we do things like isolate people or quarantine people and quarantine our staff. In fact, in Oregon, uh, where they had a, an exposure in their ICU because of the containment model in which they were operating in and because they were, uh, it was a community where nurses often worked at multiple um, multiple hospitals. Um, they literally um, had so many nurses furloughed, it was hard to deliver care um, because they were all quarantined under the containment model. Once we realize it's in our population, we have spread within our community, which is what we're seeing here in California. Um, the hope is that the government will move to a mitigation strategy. And um, California has moved, uh, they've, they've, uh, they've established a state of emergency which allows us to move to mitigation. Uh, so the mitigation approach is really designed to divide the patients based on the severity of symptoms. So individuals receive the right level of care in the right setting. 
They're designed to minimize the effects of an infection on a population when the infection can no longer be contained. Uh, mitigation strategies also allow for the appropriate use and deployment of resources to really respond to large-scale outbreak that is already embedded in the community. So it really, your, your uh, staff aren't any safer being quarantined in the community than they would be wearing protective equipment at work. So um, it, just, it just changes um, the accessibility to resources. So um, no matter uh, whether you are in containment mode or mitigation mode, um, there are some core things that you and your teams uh, need to be thinking about, and that is uh, what's your infection control plan? And that really is based on what we understand about the epidemiology and virology of this, this bug. Um, so, um, for instance, right now we're treating it um, and using really airborne precautions, but once you move to mitigation and we're not quarantining anymore, um, you can treat it for what it is, and that's droplet. Um, so really understanding uh, the, the virology and, and the recommendations that are guiding, the, the regulations that are guiding what mode you're in will drive your infection prevention plan. Human resources are our greatest uh, commodity, right? And they need to be equipped, they need to be trained on how to put on, we call it donning and doffing, put on and take off their protective equipment without um, cross-contamination or self-inoculation. Um, we need clearly defined workflows so we know exactly what we're gonna do when someone presents themselves in our emergency departments or they've called for an appointment with flu symptoms so we can anticipate them coming in and are we gonna have them meet at a back door with an escort? All these workflows are clearly defined so that our staff feel confident and protected as they face um, uh, you know, uncertainty. When we don't have clear workflows and everybody's just operating under the unknown, there goes that fear barrel curve and they don't feel valued, they don't feel protected by their organization. Um, supply chain strategy is really important. As you know, much of our um, medical supply chain does come from China and that has been halted. So uh, making sure that you're monitoring your supplies and have a daily inventory of, um, of, of where you're at and how many days of equipment that you do have and what is your relationships and um, how are you gonna order and partner with other organizations. In fact, uh, you know, one thing that we did recently is we loaned um, some protective gear to an organization and, and when they returned it, they returned it tenfold. So that was just really a kind, um, you know, you know, it was nice. It was nice of us to share, but we had, you know, it was, had no idea that it would be so kind of the return. So um, those are just some things to think about. And of course, I, the screening workflows. So. Uh, based on your entry points in your organization, how are you going to screen individuals? You know, what are the questions you're going to ask? Have you traveled? You know, and do you have those scripts um, for your staff? And then the communication plan, both internal and external, as people will be who need to come in for health care might be afraid to come. So make sure you're c communicating not only to your teams to mitigate their fears and concerns, but also the community that you serve. Um, and then um, our hospitals, and so you can go to the next slide, I think would help. Um, uh, our hospital facilities, um, you can work within your service lines to define your workflows. Things will be diff very different for surgical services and places where they're um, inserting um, airway tubes and things like that are gonna be a little bit different on how they what are the workflows for that versus a medical surgical unit? So, and, and as well as the level of care of which you're providing and how invasive that care is will determine uh, your, your workflows. So really work closely with your clinicians and your service lines to define those. And, and then in the outpatient area, there's often, um, you know, we can often anticipate our visits and people call in for their appointments. There's the walk-in side, but then there's the, anticipated side, so 
really making sure that as your schedulers or advice nurse lines are taking calls that they're screening people so you can anticipate the population coming and again can greet them at the entry point to have them safely navigate into your um, environment. Um, if you want to just go to the, I think the next slide, yeah. So there are actually, you're not alone. So um, the World Health Organization and the Centers for Disease Control have wonderful guidelines that can help healthcare facilities um, uh, have a framework to work off of. Kaiser Permanente, we have our mitigation playbook template. It's a Word document that you can, uh, that we've given to the Patient Safety Movement Foundation that you can actually download and scale and scope based on your environment. We have a very complex environment, so we didn't include everything because we have a fully integrated model of care, but I think it'll give you a nice framework to launch off of, and because it's a Word document, you can adapt it um, to your, um, your organization, the scope and scale of, of your care delivery. Um, so I'll That's turn great. it back over, yeah, to you, Donna, thank yeah. you. Thank you, and I just wanted to mention that link is here embedded in the PowerPoint presentation, but we have also linked it on our website um, where the webinar will be posted, so everybody can download it and, and modify it as needed. Thank you so much, Robin, for sharing that wonderful resource. Okay, Mike, you want to tell us a little bit about the international perspective? Yes, thank you. Uh, and I think I just want to also try and frame this um, within the some of the um, cultural elements of safety um, and some of the uh, aspects and ethical values of safety that we think are really so important. Uh, and in this particular context, I, I think transparency is, is vital and is key. Uh, but I think also is is honesty and trust, uh, honesty and trust with with uh, the systems that we are supporting and the systems of of delivery of, of of care. So I think for me, this is very important. And then candor, uh, candor when we when we work out uh, how we could have done best uh, and and where we will do better. So what we do know in the UK, and I'll give you some data. We we have a system in the UK of updating on a daily basis, and you'll see this coming through in terms of the Johns Hopkins data, but also a number of other elements that I'll talk about in a little bit uh, later. But so we have, our, as of 2 p.m. today, which is the, the when we put host, post the, the data on the Department of Health website, we have 20,338 uh, people who have been tested uh, for uh, the uh, COVID-19. But of those 20,000 plus, uh, just 163 have been confirmed. Um, for us, this, this demonstrates that we're actually, we're actually testing uh, large numbers and we have the ability to test large numbers, which is really important. I think not only for, uh, for the health system to understand that testing is available and is, and is re relatively rapid, um, but it also gives confidence, I think, to the public uh, that if they require testing, then they can have it. Testing by is done uh, through access, uh, through a, uh, an open system. Uh, we have a telephone system of, of access to local uh, local advice, uh, and you give your symptoms uh, to a, a call handler over the advice, and then you will be uh, given advice about whether or not you need to go to a testing center. Uh, we've asked, uh, we ask individuals not to go to their local health facility, but to go to a designated health testing center. Uh, where there'll be uh, samples will be taken, uh, tests will be done, and uh, results will be handed out. The interesting element about the testing system is that we we're now also, as as it is also happening uh, uh, in the US, we're now starting to sequence the viral genome, which is really important in terms of determining uh, the mutation scale uh, and the mutation numbers that are likely to happen uh, from this uh, current um, strain. So of those numbers that that uh, we have we have now we're, we're certainly now looking to see well what impact is that going to be and the modeling that we've done, uh, which we've now shared and is available uh, through Public Health England and also the UK Coronavirus Action Plan, which is a uh, a guide from the from the, uh, the Department of Health on, and it has within it a guide of what to expect for the public within that. Uh, those two plans, the Public Health England plan and the, the Corona Action Plan. Um, We've described that there is a, the modeling would suggest that uh, we're into a three to eight week period 
uh, of increase, vast increasing in numbers, a bit like happened in, uh, has happened in, in China, uh, in all our countries. Um, and that as the more we can delay uh, that, uh, those numbers, uh, the more we can level out the plateau, uh, uh, the peak effect, so that um, we can then move into into the, the, the summer season, which gives two benefits. One is that uh, if this coronavirus does react the same as others, which is an unknown quantity at the moment, it may it may start to to uh, to to uh, uh, wither uh, slightly in the summer months. But the other element to us, for it, particularly in, in countries. Uh, of our system, um, which is a population of about 60 million, uh, we start to think about whether or not uh, we can uh, use the spare capacity in the summer that we wouldn't necessarily have in the winter. So that three to eight week period, the plateau period, uh, and then the fall down is, is vital. Also shared with you the BBC link, uh, which is another link which has a series of mapping exercise on it, maps on it. Uh, and it's very interesting to look at uh, the China effect, uh, which is also uh, Johns Hopkins as well. But if you look at that, you actually do see that, that this three to eight peak period is probably modelled well, uh, and, and hopefully that will be an example uh, that we can build on. Uh, I think that's that's um, enough from me, because I know that people are anxious for questions, Donna. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much. All right. All right. One other thing. Sorry. Sorry. One, one other one apart from so the yes i'll go the, the one other thing was travel advice often travel advice is is coming forward um we we've, we've taken the uh the view that if uh if you have traveled from the initial high impact areas um um then uh, you will definitely need to be tested on arrival and and then um uh or um you um self quarantine and then test if you have symptoms when that is starting to be extended a little bit. Uh, initially, there was concerns about northern Italy, in particular, in Europe. But now, I think we've just now I think that uh, the uh, that spread uh, further afield within Italy, um, and so I think that the advice is changing almost on a on a, uh, a daily, if not certainly weekly basis, on that. So travel advice, I think, is something that needs to be tailored in, and, and each of our our systems around the world is giving tailored tailored type travel advice with regard to uh, our own um, uh, systems. Um, don't forget the World Health Organization online training uh, resources, which are a uh, fantastic resource for, for all of us to follow uh, and certainly will be a great benefit to a number of uh, resource restricted uh, countries around the world. Thank you. Sorry, Donna. Thank you. No, no problem. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. We have a few more minutes left for questions. Um, from the audience, and we have several questions. Um, and, and Mike, you actually uh, hit on one a little bit. One question was, why is the spread limited in certain areas of the globe, like, for example, Africa? Yeah, I, I did see that question pop up. Uh, I, I think it's a question that that we've we've asked here. Um, I don't think anyone knows the answer to that. Uh, one, I think one also has to recognise that the uh, the ability to capture um, symptoms, uh, the ability for patients to go into their local health communities uh, to describe their symptoms to uh, healthcare workers, whether that's uh, workers, uh, nurses, doctors, uh, or whatever, or whether or not there is a, a local surveillance system, I think is a key issue uh, in some of uh, some of our lower and middle income countries, of which uh, many are in, in Africa. So. So I'm I'm not entirely sure we know the answer to that, uh, and it may be one of of uh, um, not entirely understanding the spread, but also it may be one that we don't really understand the surveillance um, methodologies that are in place, and certainly the testing abilities uh, in some countries uh, may not be um, uh, uh, may not be in place uh, yet. Although I know that WHO is ensuring that those will be taking place. So I I think that's I think that's a watching brief. I think uh, certainly. For me, Africa is a washing brief. And and in that same vein, Mike, um, if there are people that are traveling from a, a area that does have a significant number of cases, what uh, what precautions should they take? Should everybody be quarantining themselves if they're traveling from a place like, for example, Italy? So so I think you should you should certainly um, uh, first of all. Uh, 
take the advice that you're that uh, that is in place for your own country of residence. That's the, the first and most important thing, and that's the socially responsible issue to take. Um, I think the uh, for the vast majority, it's it's one of self quarantine. If you've come from a, a an area that uh, has has the situation pretty much endemic in it, um, I think you also have to recognise that you may may or may not have symptoms. Um, uh, and so, therefore, don't use necessarily symptoms as the as the as the way forward for you. But if you do have symptoms and you've come from uh, an area that has uh, has a, a high incidence, then you you should you should get tested um, and uh, and then self quarantine until you've both until you've had the test result back, uh, but certainly at least uh, uh, self quarantine in the early stage, definitely. Excellent. Thank you. Robin, we have a few questions about the environment and about um, PPE. Can you talk about why why masks, why people may be saying that masks don't work? And also talk a little bit about how long that virus uh, lives um, on a mm -hmm. surface or even on the on your elbow if we're telling everybody to cough uh -huh. into their elbow. Yeah, we actually don't know right now how long it lives. Um, I'll, as far as surfaces, one of the one of our workflows is that after we have a what we call a person under investigation in a room or a positive COVID individual, once they leave the room, um, we close the door and we uh, kind of let the environment settle for one hour before we go in and clean all the surfaces. So uh, that's. Uh, that's just one thing we we don't know how long it does live on surfaces, so that's the other, and that's the whole uh, concept around don't touch your face, don't touch your eyes, and wash your hands. Uh, so um, right now, I can't really give you that information. This is Steve. If I could add something, I've seen some reports that it if it's in droplets, it can live on surfaces for at least six hours. So I would I would just assume the worst on that. <laughs> that uh, surfaces need to be cleaned mm -hmm. and and cleaned dry, right. kept. That's right. It's it's the dwell time, right? Make sure that yeah. you know how long um, something should a cleaner should kind of dwell on the surface to actually um, kill the germ. And again, that goes to your workflows, or um, you know, even in your own home environment. You know, if you use some sort of a, um, a a cleaner that has a germicide in it. Make sure that you let it sit on that surface for a little bit of time, or make it moist and just let it dry. Uh, that's really the best way to do it. Great, thank you so much. Um, there's another question about immunity. Does anybody want to talk about whether or not we, where are we with the uh, you know the knowledge that we have about immunity to this virus? Hmm. Uh, one one Another, quick point. Can you get there's, it again after you have it? There's one documented case for sure of somebody who got it twice in China. So lots of yeah, data still coming is, out. Yeah, yeah. So the the you know the the belief is that this is a a novel virus, so a first time. So more people will get sick, but. Um, with illnesses, we do, especially these, especially viruses um, and other corona type viruses, we do develop an immunity to them and don't get them again um, in general. But um, like Dr. Barker said, there's always, you know, there's always the immunosuppressed and we can get things again uh, if we become compromised over time. However, uh, consecutive inoculations in a community are generally at a much lower level than the first. Great, thank you so much. Um, there are some some questions about the um, the handling of PPE, and I I think that uh, uh, for the just in the interest of time, because we only have two minutes left, um, I'll direct everybody with questions about how to manage the environment, PPE, and such to the resources that we have linked in the PowerPoint presentation. Um, and, and then I, I think there was one more question um, about about staffing. Uh, somebody from a critical access hospital, I think this is a great question, not just for critical access hospitals and 
but for all healthcare organizations. Robin, you touched on it a little bit, um, but how, what, do you have any ideas of what strategies we can, um, we can put in place for healthcare organizations that are terribly short staffed? Yeah. Well, you need to have, you need to anticipate it. So um, as part of our strategy, um, we are, uh, we anticipate that more people will be out. So if we have a registry that we use uh, for contingent staff workers, which most people do have a relationship, we make arrangements in advance and we just say, hey, we, we think we're going to need about five or six resources and could we in advance um, kind of have an arrangement where you would make those individuals available for you? Sometimes you do prepay, uh, you know, a percentage of the fee, um, but that's one thing that you can do to anticipate. But really the best thing to do is to keep yourself, your, your staff healthy by giving them the equipment and, that they need and then to have workflows and environmental um, cleaning protocols that will um, keep people healthy. Excellent, excellent. Well, we're right at nine o'clock, but there is one, one question that I think um, might be worth talking about real, real fast. Uh, the question was uh, about pregnant women. Um, is there any specific concerns that pregnant women need to be worried about or a nursing mom? Anybody have the, the answer to that? Uh. I don't, I don't know that I have a specific answer, but I wouldn't, I would encourage um, to continue nursing your baby because um, even if you have a cold or, or something, you're developing immunity, immunity and uh, we know that through breastfeeding that um, those things are passed uh, to the baby. I don't know, Dr. Barker, any other thoughts? Uh, you, you're, just to clarify, you're saying the immunity is passed to the baby, not uh, not the bud itself. That's correct. And I I think that's usually true. Yeah, um, but I I think we don't know um, about this virus, so. <laughs> right. Yeah. There's so yeah. much about this that we don't know. That's the yeah. That's the scary thing to keep in mind. We're making assumptions based on our previous experience with coronavirus, but this one is new. That's right, and and you know, so that's a great way for us to end this. I think everybody needs to, um, you know, recognize that because this is a new outbreak, there is information that is coming out from the World Health Organization and the CDC on a continuous basis, and so um, so we'd like to direct you to those sites for updates moving forward. Um, based on how fast things are changing, this particular presentation may be outdated pretty shortly here. So. We will have this, we will post this presentation on our website. We will send the, pre the PowerPoint as a PDF to everybody so that you can have the link to click on. Um, but moving forward, please, uh, if you're looking for additional information, please make sure that the World Health Organization or your country's Centers for Disease Control are your source of truth. Okay. Well. Um, thank you so much. We are two minutes past the hour, and so thank you, everybody, for joining us. And we will uh, have all of this on our website very short. Oh, it's actually already on the website, so this is exciting. And we will send this to you, as, a, as I said, in a PDF form. But if you don't get it for some reason, uh, please head to our website, and, um, and you'll find it there. Thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful day. Very good. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, guys. Bye bye. Bye. Bye bye. Thank you, Donna, for hosting it. And